Here we see a screenshot of our test scene, which we would like to enhance by adding a number of non-directional lights, such as point lights. I'll use point lights for this example, but the explanation holds for any type of light with a limited range. As you can see, each light affects only a relatively small area in the final image. Therefore, it would be inefficient to do lighting calculations that would use every light for each pixel. In tile-based lighting, we divide the screen area in a grid of tiles and determine which lights intersect each tile. We then create a bucket for each tile that contains the indices of all lights that affect the pixels within it. In general, the number of lights per tile is low enough for forward rendering. Obviously, the more lights there are in the scene, the more lights will intersect each tile. This is also the case when the lights have relatively long ranges, which makes them more probable to affect large parts of the scene. Viewing the scene from above, we can see that the tiles will be extended in 3D space to form a grid of frustums. Also note that the only parts of the objects that are rendered are the triangles that are facing the camera, which are not occluded by another object. Ideally, we want to only keep lights that affect these visible triangles. We can use the minimum and maximum depth value of objects within each frustum to make them occupy a space that is as small as possible. The lights that are not intersecting any of these frustums are ignored. In this example, the yellow lights can be called since they are not intersecting any frustums. The green lights are kept and they do actually affect visible areas in the scene. The red lights are also kept, however, there is no geometry that's lit by these lights. They are called false positives. This is pretty much the basic recipe for tile-based light calling. To summarize, we need to take the following steps. Calculate the four side planes for each frustum in the grid. In the light calling shader, construct the additional front and back planes for each frustum from the minimum and maximum depth values. This completes the frustum and it can be used for intersection testing with all lights in the scene. For each frustum, keep the lights that intersect and use them for lighting in the pixel shader. Here we only use the lights in each bucket to render pixels within each tile. In the coming episodes, we'll see how we can construct a grid of frustums and use it for intersection testing with lights. We'll write compute shaders for grid frustum generation and light calling. After our base implementation, we'll look at methods to improve the overall speed and accuracy of light calling. Today we are going to write a compute shader to compute the grid frustums. As I mentioned, each frustum consists of four planes. We'll express planes in normal form. Let's consider a plane with a normal n. We can take any two arbitrary points on this plane and use them to create a vector. Because this vector is also on the plane, we can conclude that it's perpendicular to the plane's normal vector. Mathematically, it means that the dot product of the normal with this vector equals zero. If we select any of the two initial points, we can take the dot product of the vector from the origin to this point and the normal vector and call it d or distance. This scalar value together with plane's normal vector will uniquely describe the plane. Therefore, this is the only data we need in order to define planes in our code. Note that for the planes that include the origin, the distance can be zero and therefore the plane can be described by its normal only. Before writing any code, I'd like to give an overview of compute shaders. A compute shader is an HLSL function like the ones in vertex and pixel shaders. The biggest difference is that we can tell the GPU how many of these functions we want to run in parallel. That's why we call the code in a compute shader a thread. Threads are executed in thread groups, which resemble a 3D vector. We can define the dimensions of a thread group at compile time using the num threads attribute. The collection of all threads in this 3D vector is a thread group. As an example, here we have a thread group that's 4x5 in x and y direction and has a depth of 2. The coordinates of each thread can be obtained from a system value, SV group thread ID, which is a 3D unsigned integer. We can also get the linear or flattened index of each thread from another system value, SV group index. Of course, we can also calculate this index, but it's easier to get it from the system value. 
In the host application, we can spawn compute shaders by calling command lists dispatch function. Here we can determine how many thread groups we want to run. This is again a 3D array of thread groups. We can change the dimensions of each dispatch at runtime. As an example, here we have a dispatch of 9 thread groups. Similar to thread IDs within a thread group, we can get group IDs within a dispatch from SV group ID, which is a 3D unsigned integer. Let's consider a dispatch with 8 thread groups and 9 threads per group. The coordinates of each thread within the dispatch is also available as a 3D unsigned integer, which we can get from SV dispatch thread ID. Here are a few examples of dispatch thread IDs. This is useful when our threads are based on screen positions and we want to determine which thread corresponds to which tile on screen. We can see already that we could use this to calculate one frostum per thread as long as we determine the correct number of thread groups depending on screen dimensions. We'll see how this works in more detail in the next video. We now know just enough to write our first compute shader. Another way of inspecting the data during rendering is by using a program such as RenderDoc. There's also Pix for Windows and NVIDIA's Insight, and I'm sure AMD has got something too, but I can't remember. Anyway, RenderDoc is actually a cool application that we can use to capture what happens during one or more frames of a graphics application. It supports OpenGL, Vulkan, and Direct3D, which makes it perfect for our renderer. And it's a free and open source software that you can download from renderdoc.org. This is not going to be a tutorial on RenderDoc, since it would take multiple videos. Instead, I'm going to show you how you can inspect your data using this application. First, we need to run our application using the Launch Application tab. Here, you can also configure how the application is allowed to run. For this example, I just pointed to our engine test application and hit launch. The game windows appear to be larger than what we are used to, because I zoomed in, so it's easier for us to read the text in RenderDoc. I'll close all windows except one. Here we can see that it's running like normal, but now we have this heads-up display on top with info about the graphics API, frame number and frame time. Next, we can capture a frame. We have the option to capture a frame immediately, after some delay, or even capture a frame with a specific frame number. We'll go with capture immediately, since it doesn't really matter in this case. After pressing this button, we see that it captured a frame with about 100 megabytes of data. We could continue and capture more frames if we want, but right now we can go ahead and close the engine test. When the application is closed, RenderDoc will process and show the data for the captured frame. Here we can inspect the textures that are used. In our application, the only textures are the render target and depth stencil texture, so there's not a lot to see here. We can also see what's going on at each pipeline stage during the frame. We can walk through all steps in each frame using this timeline. Here we see the depth prepass and the color pass, for example. In the Mesh Viewer, the current vertex and index buffers for each draw call can be inspected. And here on the left side we can see a list of all API calls that were made during the frame. Now if we want to see the content of any GPU resource, we can open Resource Inspector, where we are presented with a list of all resources. Here we can select the resource we want to inspect by double-clicking it. The selected resource title here is changed accordingly. Since we want to see the grid frostums buffer content, we select it and click on View Content button. Here we see the data in the buffer as hexadecimal integer values. This is because RenderDoc doesn't know what the data format is for this buffer. Luckily, it's rather easy to specify this by just writing the format in C language. Remember that our frostums have four planes and each plane has a normal and a distance value. We can simply write that here and click Apply. Now it's showing us the values in this format. You can see for yourself that the normal values have a length of 1. 
Also note how the distance values are really close to zero. Note that the signs of the X component for left and right planes point to the right and left respectively. Likewise, the signs of the Y component for top and bottom planes point down and up. As we saw before, normals near the center have their Z component close to zero, whereas normals near the edges have larger positive and negative Z components. This was all for grid frustums calculation. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and learned something new. In the next episode, we are going to write our light culling shader and use it for lighting. It will have basically the exact same steps as we took for the grid frustums, but obviously it serves a different purpose. As always, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.